just shine the top bit of my sword. Well, <laughs> this is tricky. Actually, maybe bring it closer and put it down more so, so we don't all become the suspect. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> That's okay. Is that okay? Okay. <clears throat> so tonight, just for fun, I'm not going to ask you to sit comfortably. <laughs> Arada used to say, um, <clears throat> that was the teacher of Yasatani, who was the teacher of Yamada, who was the teacher of Robert Aiken, who was the teacher of me. And he used to say, during Teisho, just be the, the sole person listening to the Teisho, be the only listener. It's an interesting way of understanding how to dissolve into the Teisho. Okay, so, and tonight I'm coming back to that beautiful offer of IQ, a kind of throw away, throw everything away kind of line, which is, the wise know nothing at all, no thing at all. <clears throat> well, he says, maybe one song. So let's look into this one song. <clears throat> and to do so, I'd like to take up case 37 of the Blue Cliff Record. When Panjan, who in Japanese becomes Banzan, you might have heard of him in that form more often than as Panjan, his Chinese name. Panjan said, there are no things in the world. <clears throat> so where would you seek the mind? There are no things in the world. So where would you seek the mind? And another time in a story in which he's well known, it's the Banzan, Panchan. It's a story of him going past in the marketplace, passing a, <clears throat> a butcher's stall where there was a a sort of demanding customer saying, give me your best meat. I want only the best meat in your shop. And the shopkeeper said, but everything is best. Everything in the shop is best. And Banzan Panchan, <clears throat> Panchan took this everything is best deeply to heart. Every not don't run them together, not everything. Everything is best. And yet he says here, there are no things in the world. What are we going to do with this? Does this disaster where we find ourselves? <laughs> <clears throat> when <clears throat> when he says everything is best. He's pointing to there is no thing to pick over and choose or reject. Everything is best. And in fact, in, in fact, in a way, he is pointing to the fact that or of the grave importance of each thing. We speak of life and death is a grave matter. This is almost pointing to the strong attention demanded by everything. If it is best and beyond judgment, then it has grave and beautiful importance. Everything. Or as Tori Zenji says, each particle of matter, each moment, is no other than the Tathagata's inexpressible radiance. How can you go, how can you even wander towards the word best? In that, it's beyond best. When Pan Chan says, where would you seek the mind? 
the mind at that point is not just the same as my mind, <clears throat> the one that is seldom at rest. The mind is your own completeness, your realized mind, your settled heart. And that's not some kind of um, one-off matter. Please never mistake it for a one-off matter. The, the beautiful work and play of realizing this one mind <clears throat> is never done, like women's work. Never done. <clears throat> so, no things. Have a look at how this lines up with or has an intimate um, affinity with Mu, which is sometimes translated roughly as no thingness. No thingness. That seamlessness we looked at on one of the nights. Very much the matter that Mu invites us into. But this no thing, how about those moments when you lose yourself in some tree here and the wind in some tree? and you can feel your own leaves moving. Is that a thing or no thing? Is there a, a self left to even wonder exactly about that? So we are in the world or the mind of Panchan here, Panchan, where every thing is best and there are no things in the world. <clears throat> Harkowen commented on this case saying it was especially excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, <clears throat> at a glance it seems trifling, it's very brief, but it is a pearl in a worn out cloth purse. Perhaps the worn-out cloth purse is you or me and we're fogged in. But from another point of view, he's saying a pool in something so ordinary, no thief would even pick it up. You know, we, these sneaky dogs, <laughs> always on the lookout for some precious thing to pick up and make off with. So a pool in a worn-out cloth purse he goes on and says, those who know <clears throat> do recognize it is a treasure. And then he adds, very hako and like, he says, somehow it seems that no one really understands this saying, this koan. Uh, perhaps that's its saving grace. No one understands it. No one can pick it apart. It has to be taken whole. <clears throat> So I don't think he's simply regretting our general donkey state or our sneaky dog attempts. He's, there's something else here. This not understanding turns us around towards a direct encounter or, and re-encounter over and again. And after all, aren't these no things right in front of you at every moment? What is there to go off to try to understand? How about not going off and standing there? So <clears throat> a pole in a worn out cloth purse, this suggests something like a kind of palm in the hand, palm in the hand koan, you've always got it with you. Or a little bit like that jewel sewn into the robes of someone who went off to lose themselves in the world and someone wise said well later on they'll need this and they sewed a jewel into the robe that he she wore all of us have got that jewel sewn in we're just waiting to remember it again and again <clears throat> but a small koan like this you can take it with you so when you're out walking in the bush, declare 
to each thing that draws you close. There are no things in the world. <laughs> and see how the world, the earth, the creatures, and you yourself respond in that space. No things. Nothing to carve up. Not even I, me, myself. Nothing carved out. And yet each thing standing bright in its own nature. And clarity. So the koan is asking us to look at what is this mind of no things in the world. When do you encounter this shining evidence, inexpressible radiance? <clears throat> well, let's take a look at this matter through the eyes of Shakyamuni Buddha. Probably everybody knows some of the kind of foundation stories of the Buddha. The one about being raised in a palace. <clears throat> he certainly did belong to a highborn family, a kind of local, I guess you could say monarch family, but small tribal kind of world at that point. But nevertheless, by those, in those days, by those terms, a palace. And... The story is that he was carefully protected from perceiving suffering. Not sure how this was managed. <laughs> For example, when he accidentally pooed his pants as a baby. <laughs> Did he suffer in some way? <clears throat> we don't know. The record doesn't include that detail. <laughs> Perhaps he just enjoyed it. Lots of children do. <laughs> <laughs> However, <clears throat> one time when he managed to escape the vigilance of those who wanted to keep him from ever noticing suffering, um, <clears throat> he perceived aging, sickness and death in the world. And he perceived that there is for all sentient beings, there is unavoidable suffering, which, of course, turned his mind to the even more fascinating matter of avoidable suffering, of suffering we don't have to inflict on ourselves or anybody else. There's also the story of leaving home in order to find this out, and um, in one version of the story, leaving his wife, Yasodhara, and newborn baby, Rahula, um, to go to discover the real. <laughs> Beyond that. <laughs> Beyond a newborn baby. Rahula, in one version of the translation of his name, that is obstacle. Rahula, baby, obstacle. But there's another translation and another account of this story in which, in which Yasodhara somehow divined the fact that he needed to go and resolve the suffering of the world. <clears throat> and so she, they made love that night and she let him go. And a baby was the consequence of that lovemaking. And how does the story go? Then for six years, while he was making his way through that familiar passage of self-denial and then the middle path and then sitting under the tree, the Bodhi tree, waking up with the morning star. And all of that time in this version of the story, Yasodhara was sort of tracking this inwardly in her own experience. <clears throat> and in one version, the gestation period of Rahula was six years. So, <laughs> <laughs> But this is a mythic account. This is an account to draw us into a deeper understanding. And from one point of view, that is a more... I guess you could say, um, from women's point of view, a more joyful understanding than the idea that to realise the great matter, you have to put aside so much that is fundamental to this human life, including women, bodies, bleeding, babies, raising children, wiping bottoms, and so on. Householding, in other words. 
So, <clears throat> now I want to introduce you to an earlier story even than that, <clears throat> which could be in a way regarded as the most foundational one of all because it is childhood, from the childhood of the Buddha. An awareness there of undivided, undividedness, the, which you could say, and this is true for all of us, isn't it, that in our childhoods we have moments of undivided awareness. We know it and we have to, in a way, as adults, because childhood is not awakening, not yet, but it is closer in many times, many moments to undivided awakeness. And in a way that can be a kind of seed inspiration to set us on the path of resuming as adults who embrace the whole fabric of human life, not just the best bits, because everything is best. So that means you embrace every part. So this is the story <clears throat> that when Siddhartha Shakyamuni almost died from the harsh austerities he'd been practicing, a memory floated into his mind of a moment in his childhood. He was placed under a rose apple tree and forgotten for a while. Mm. Forgotten. <clears throat> He's a little boy, <clears throat> scarcely more than a baby. He looks around and senses how pleasant the air is and the hills and the shade, the grass, the branches, the sunspots coming through the leaves, all of them round and fluctuating in and out of each other. There is nothing else on his mind. A little bit like Shikantaza, nothing else. Nobody is looking at him. The world pays no attention. So no self-presentation, no performance of any kind. The boy's eyes slowly scan the whole scene. There is no resistance. There is no tension. There is nothing missing. Everything is completed, self-sufficient. There is nothing to add, nothing to subtract. Cautiously, his adult mind, this is looking back, penetrates itself, then almost playing, formulates these words. So he's now looking back at that childhood experience and formulating these words in his adult mind. Perhaps this is the way that leads to awakening. And then, in this telling of the story, very interestingly, and then a question forms. Are you afraid of this happiness? Mm -hmm. Are you afraid of this completeness? How interesting is that? <clears throat> to, to find what you could almost call the productive worm of doubt that opens things up the squirm of resistance that lets us overcome, meet and be equal to and, and in a sense enlarged by overcoming resistance. <clears throat> there is this eternal mystery, and I don't think anybody will ever solve it, of the human temptation to turn away from our most natural wholeness. Are you afraid? Is there... A little, are you, do you want to move, Sarah? Are you, okay. <clears throat> are you, is there some kind of fear in this subtle resistance? And so the word afraid is so interesting there. We learn from you and men, the whole earth is medicine. So what is there to be, what is there to turn away from here? What draws back? What leaves us stranded, apart, splitting up the world. 
And could it somehow also be the gift of restoration, of being gathered back in? Is restoration worth the price, the painful price of admission? That's a question to explore with your own practice. The mystery of, of why it is we, we subtly walk at the open door, the great door. Sometimes it's when people are very close to falling free, they think, I'll just sit here for a bit longer. Mm. <laughs> I'll just contemplate whether or not, if or but. Or on one occasion it could be, and I, this happened to me at a Rohatsu session in Hawaii, I sat up in Yaza, <clears throat> open sitting, just the darkened, beautiful thing, just the darkened dojo, one candle, and sit there as long or not as it wants. And very soon in that darkened space, I found myself toppling forward, not physically, but toppling away. And it was wonderful, but... I remembered I had to get on a plane at midnight. (laughs) (laughs) The next day I had to be on my way. It was going to be, I had to get back to my five-year-old daughter. I had to travel. I had to, so I thought, I'll leave it there for now. (laughs) (laughs) I'll come back to this later. And of course, I regretted it deeply as well. Never, ever draw back. So this, even the story, um, the Buddha story, has what is so fundamental as a kind of archetypal story about being human, that we are born rich kids, born in a palace, have everything. And as a child, you sort of know that. You rely Oh, nothing truly missing, at least until neuroticisms creep in. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, we somehow do let this split quality creep into us. It happens through whatever means it happens. I could speculate on language, on on the mind of right and wrong and so on, but let's not do that. Let's not philosophically speculate. We notice that we leave the palace of everything is best. And we wander through the world lost. Sometimes it's depicted as a dark wood. We get lost in a dark wood with no bridges as well. (laughs) And we have to win our way back to that lost wholeness. There seems to be, for some reason, which is to say really for no reason, It seems necessary that we leave it, lose it, find ourselves lost for the extraordinary gift of finding our way back. And perhaps this is another way to look into that phrase of the Buddha, the truth of suffering, the truth of it, this inarguable human truth that suffering itself is a strange gift of the way itself. So, are you afraid? Do you fear this completeness? Do you contract from it? Do you hide from it? Do you successfully rationalize it away? And if so, why? This haunting human question, why, why? So many of you will know the yun-men, the powerful yun-men offer in this realm, which is the whole earth is medicine. Maybe you can sense how that moment under the rose apple tree is exactly that offer, the whole earth medicine, just as it is. Nothing to be healed. Whole already. But in the koan, Yun-men actually says three things, and the first of them is, 
medicine and sickness heal each other. Interesting. Medicine and sickness heal each other. If you understand sickness as, well, dividedness and the suffering that flows from that dividedness, that sense of separateness, separation, alone here, against the world, medicine you could perhaps understand as the undivided consciousness. Medicine and sickness heal into each other, heal each other, become inseparable with no things to be found. You could think of this koan, medicine and sickness, pointing to a comment, a subsidiary comment at least, about dharma, the medicine for the sickness of dividedness and its suffering. You could also see it, medicine and sickness, apparent antitheses, heal into, become whole. Um, this is a way of saying, uh, pointing to a non-dual understanding of both medicine and sickness. not opposed, not able to be opposed at some level of our realisation. So, medicine and sickness look like two different things. Are they? Can they be said to be? There are no things in the world, says, reminds us, Panchan reminds us. <clears throat> the words of Torres Zenji speak about each particle of matter, each thing, each breath, each moment, is no other than the Tathagata's inexpressible radiance. Now that is talking about the mind of the Buddha a clear, open, radiant mind of awakeness. You're awake. Uh, mind. And <clears throat> when you think of, uh, I'm just trying to follow my notes here, each of us is a particular flowering of impermanence. And how this, how this starts to work as the koan moves through to the next um, statement is, which is going to be the whole earth is medicine, we begin to see how each flowering of impermanence, each, each particle of matter, each moment, brings forth the whole seamless, the seamless whole. And here's a kind of glimpse of the net of Indra, where each particular thing in its facets reflects every other particular thing in the net of Indra and the entire interwoven net itself. Interwoven and particular, seamless and particular. We have to go into this sort of level of inquiry to really be under, to really understand this especially excellent koan. <laughs> and if you can hold um, medicine and sickness heal into each other within the crisis of the earth, the, the situation we cannot avoid, we must face, and with any crisis in your life, as well, the crisis, the sickness, and the salvation, the medicine, are inside each other. There's a very interesting deep matter to look into there. There's also the possibility that the mind in its whole state is medicine. Well, for a very split world. So then comes um, 
that statement from Yun Men. And just before I go there, I'll just read what I said in Minding the Earth about this koan and how it first hit me. The first time I heard this old Chinese Zen koan, I felt the night sky and the centre of the earth as my own bone marrow. Koans are like that anyway, but this one more than most. You will be gradually getting to know how to be around koans, well, that's what the book does, and blah, blah, blah. But like <clears throat> black and white cats, spotted pardalotes, red kelpies, clumps of seaweed, river pebbles, all perfectly humble potatoes, being with them in person, that is, being with koans in person, is greatly more instructive than anything you could ever presume to know in advance. The first two parts produce the immediate feeling of, I know, I know, followed by a fascinated wondering, but I don't know how I know, and I don't know what kind of knowing this is. The first part excited my thinking, medicine and sickness not only inseparable, but mysteriously each other already. The second one cut right through thinking, like an exhilarating bodily plunge into understanding, as if the natural outcome of how wondrous and beloved I found the earth to be when I faced it without flinching. And then there is the last part of this koan, which I'll just tell you is when Yunmen then asks. So, then, what is this self? What is this self? And the last part, well, it is the question that a self-reflexive consciousness continually asks of every human being, posed to us in every detail of what we perceive and experience in this life. So the whole world is medicine. Do you remember uh, that, have you heard about, if you weren't there at the time, that in 1968, when the Apollo 8 space mission, with three astronauts in it, but they were the first human beings to see the world whole, to see the Earth whole, Mm -hmm. to see the planet in space. And I don't know if you remember this detail, but they wept at the sight. Possibly they had a sense of, how do you go past this whole gift, this whole medicine, this whole healing fact? Or for the Buddha, that rose apple tree, that moment under the tree, that dance, a very different tree to the Bodhi tree, the dance of light and shade, the perfume, no one looking, no self to be presented. This state of no things in the world was who he was, no different. And if you're wondering how you get from this no things in the world, that seamless yet particular quality, utterly particular, then notice the final question, the final push Yun Men gives us to... Let us meet ourselves at ease and awake. Then what is this self? You could almost hear, what else, what other is this self? Than this rose apple tree or out on the mossy grass moment or light on the reflection pool or the candle flame or you've complete that sentence for yourself. So, we find here a kind of resting point, the place of return to rest, just as you are. It is a personal matter, this whole world or whole earth is medicine. Anne Carson, the poet Anne Carson, offered a kind of incidental koan or accidental koan when she said in a poem, there is no person 
without a world, without a whole world, without the whole world. The whole world is what is this very person in its deepest sense. The person implies the world and the world creates and implies person, personal, intimate. And then there's this question of our resistance, our demons, if you like. It's very interesting to think about these forms of resistance as a kind of demon. From another point of view, they're everything that we think about ourselves that can't possibly have Buddha nature, <laughs> the things that cause us shame. A kind of they create a kind of demon. Of course, we're told in our sutras, Buddha nature pervades the whole world existing right here and now. So how can any part how can any part of your being lack Buddha nature? But there are parts of ourselves that cause us shame. And it's interesting to notice that when other people tell us, tell you about their shame, notice how tender that moment is, how there's a, a great tenderness in that revelation of um, the openness of that, the sense of almost intimacy itself is a kind of enlightenment, an enlightening <clears throat> and it's happening right there in hell, the hell of having demons, of having the sorts of things we talked about last night. <clears throat> Just to sort of bundle that up, there's a, another koan in which someone comes to Jajo saying, and quoting, a Zen master falls into hell. And then he asks, how is this possible? someone who is so-called enlightened, <clears throat> Jajo says, they're the first to go there. <laughs> <laughs> they're the first to go there. And if that seems strange, take yourself to the moment in Tore Zenji's Bodhisattva's vow, when he says, when you receive abusive language and are confronted by someone who persecutes you and hates you at that moment. What do you look for? What is this first to go there? Well, he calls it the open response to such abuse. The first to go there. When, by the way, in that koan, the teacher, the student goes on to say, why? <laughs> why? Jajo says, how else could they be of any help? to all beings. But the immediacy that is possible of the open response instead of the defended reaction to abuse is not unlike going to the place where there is neither heat nor cold. It has no no in it. It is free of no. But you have to be quick to go there. Mm. Very quick. Get past yourself very fast. To befriend your demons right there in hell. So, just to sort of bring some of these threads together. First of all, I want to go back to take you to two tiny poems of Ikkyu. Ikkyu is very generous because his poems are very brief. And they also just run on, they just flow on. There are no, there's no punctuation, there's no lines, they're just things that flow, pretty much like us. Here's one, and I'll say it in the flowing on form. Don't worry, please, how many times do I have to say it? There's no way not to be who you are and where. <laughs> Don't 
don't worry, please. I like the please to be in there. <laughs> don't worry, please. How many times do I have to say it? There's no way not to be who you are and when, where. So again, you must ask yourself, how many times do we have to recover this wholeness? And who's counting? What does it matter? At a certain level, how does it matter? Each time is a rich chance. Each time is interesting. It's not a pity. It's a chance. How many times do we have to recover the fact that there is no way not to be who you are, just as you are, and where you are? And if you can't sense the rose blossom, the rose apple blossom tree in that, try it in this one. Also EQ. Flowers are silent, silence is silent. The mind is a silent flower. The silent flower of the world opens. Flowers are silent, silence is silent. The mind is a silent flower. The silent flower of the world opens. That silent flower of the mind has no things in it, no things in the world. It just has what um, Shun Ryo so beautifully put to bring these two together. It just has things as it is, not things as they are, but things as it is. That was actually his funny Japanese English that produced that wonderful <laughs> <laughs> wisdom. Things as it is. Do you see how that brings together? No things in the world and everything is best. So maybe just to give you a slightly longer poem to pass the time. Um, this one is that sort of patron saint of Buddhism, Mary Oliver. It's called Mindful. I can't avoid that word. <clears throat> Every day I see or hear something that more or less kills me with delight, that leaves me like a needle in the haystack of light. It was what I was born for, to look, to listen, to lose myself inside this soft world, low edges, soft world, to instruct myself over and over in joy and acclamation. Nor am I talking about the exceptional, the fearful, the dreadful, the very extravagant, but of the ordinary, the common, the very drab, the daily presentations. Oh, good student, I say to myself, how can you help but grow wise with such teachings as these? The untrimmable light of the world, the oceans shine, oceans shine, the prayers that are made out of grass and the insects crawling in it and, <laughs> and... So, so, as I mentioned earlier, we're never done with this process. We're never able to be done. It's never able to be done. <clears throat> and the reason why is because we and it are endless flow. Never the same. In the light of this and the fact of impermanence and everything passing through in the most gracious way, endlessly, it's said from a Zen point of view that the Buddha is still practicing. We don't have a stainless image of the Buddha in perfection. We have a Buddha in some heaven, no doubt, some pretty advanced heaven. We can't work out the number of it. <laughs> but he is still practicing deeply. 
for all beings. Oh, look at us. It's clear he's still practicing for all mm-hmm. beings. Mm-hmm. So, I'll just um, wrap this up with Suedo's verse, partly because we can't go past it. I mentioned last night that Suedo has this habit of not just muttering in between lines of other people's verses and comments, but <clears throat> he also um, off- offers a verse himself to every case in the Blue Cliff Record, and this is his verse. Hakuin calls it a verse far surpassing the whole Buddhist canon. <laughs> so you better listen to it. <laughs> and when he says that, you know, could he mean this sound, the subtle sounds of this quiet evening after rain has fallen? Hmm, well, let's look. Here's the verse which seems to have words for a moment. No things in the world where to seek mind. White clouds make a canopy, flowing streams, a lute. One tune, two tunes, no one understands. When the rain's passed, In the evening ponds, the autumn water is deep. So there's a number of little traces in here. The first recapitulates the koan and then responds to it with the rest of the poem. Sorry, yeah, the koan and then gives you a a response. White clouds make a canopy, flowing streams, a lute, Clouds and streams are the way of evoking initiate monks, unsui, flowing water monks. Um, So there's a little undertone of that, you know, just stepped into the practice, which we always are doing, only just. And somehow the flowing streams create a lute, a musical lute, which seems to then produce one tune, two tunes, No one understands. One tune, what's that? Is that the undivided? That's one tune. Two tunes, what's that? Is that each one of the myriad things? Each one, a grave matter. Well, no one understands, fortunately, because there's no one there wanting, even wanting, to do such a thing. And because there's no one who understands, he then hopefully adds a line of song. This is what he sings. When the rain has passed in the evening ponds, the autumn water is deep. And I don't know if you can feel into this, but there's simply things just as it is right there. Rain has fallen, the evening ponds, the water is deeper than it was, just ordinary. And there's also a way of evoking maturity of practice. When the rains passed in the evening ponds, going into the dark, the autumn water is deep. It has deepened. And this session, if you're half awake, the autumn water has deepened. In you. And Hakuin's final comment on this, he says, those ponds where the water is cool are the secret melody of no things in the world. Secret melody. Perhaps that's the one song, you know, Taking you back to the opening part of the queue, the wise know nothing, no thing at all. Well, maybe one song. Now you know what it is. (laughs) Thank you for staying awake.